Come here, Scout. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Scout got a haircut. And I think he's maybe identifying as a girl now. Yeah. He's a pretty good old dog. The kind of the saying around our house is small dog, small brain. But ever since Dash died, you know, Scout's been doing pretty good. He, 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 for a little foo foo dog, I call him, he protects the house and yeah, he's, he's an all right dog. He loves getting out. And, but yeah, he looks pretty pathetic. I was just thinking, actually, I forgot to do it. I was going to go to the bathroom here before I started this. I was like, yeah, it would be kind of a bummer if I had to get up in the middle of this thing and go to the bathroom. I remember one time I was speaking in Omaha, Nebraska at a sports show. And these were, this was back in the days we were raising three kids and, you know, just kind of starting out. And every dollar, man, <laughs> every dollar meant something and uh, um, I was so sick the one day and they used to work me like a mule at these sports shows sometimes I'd have to speak like that one was like a five-day show and then like like the Friday and Saturday particularly like Saturday I'd speak like three times I remember what day it was but I was sicker than a dog and I had to speak and I didn't want to like have to give up any of the money they were paying me to speak um and so i just i'm like well i gotta speak you know and i remember during the middle of my presentation i had to excuse myself go around the back and vomit in a trash can <laughs> just to keep rolling because <laughs> i was not going to give up a dollar of the money they were paying me because we needed it too bad ah I brought my binos along. Might see a black bear, they'd be popping out. We got one running around the place here, but got some geese in the background. I heard some mallards earlier. Uh, so I'm gonna share the story uh, that I was gonna share a couple of weeks ago that I filmed a couple of times and never did use and um, try to stay on, on topic. But last weekend, I, well last week I didn't share uh, an episode here. I had uh, Barry and Karen Barton, well, the whole family, uh, Barry and Karen Barton came up and visited our family last weekend, so we are kind of just enjoying the time with them. So it was a nice visit. Barry, if you've watched any of my videos, you've seen him. He's hunted with me many times. He first called me, oh, I don't know, about seven or eight years ago, I suppose, and he, his story was he wanted to hunt sheep, but he wasn't sure if he knew um, if he could do it or not because he had two artificial knees. He was like 59, 60 years old. He had hunted Alaska before for moose, but he said, you know, I've watched all your videos and I feel like if anybody can get me a sheep, it's you. And I had a didn't have an opening for sheep for a couple of years, and so I did have a brown bear opening. I'm like, well, you interested in hunting brown bear? And in in the background, I heard his wife care, and she's like, he'll he'll do it, he'll do it. You know, she was listening to the conversation, and so she she was really supporting him to do it. So he comes up, shoots a great big bear, biggest bear I ever guided for, uh, squared ten foot eight, and. Um, biggest hide wise anyway um and then he came sheep hunting shot a sheep we did several hunts together and we got to be pretty close friends after our first bear hunt one thing that he said he, you can actually find it on youtube um he said you know billy took care of me like like a son and man that was a pretty darn good compliment but him and uh, his wife Karen came out to visit one time about four or five years ago. Yeah, probably five, six years ago now. Kids were real little. Um, actually, my, on, my, on that bear hunt, my first hunt with Barry, that was the year Frankie, my daughter, was born. And so that was my last hunt of the season. So it was two months since Frankie was born and I still hadn't seen her. And Barry's like, man, you got to get home, you know. Um, <laughs> 
So Barry and Karen come out to visit. They buy the girls this water park, one of these blow up jobs, and then you hook a garden hose to it. And um, they, so the girls were, were going down this slide and had a little pool of water at the bottom. They were having a big time. And Barry brought out his uh, 300 uh, short mag, this custom rifle that he had. He was coming deer hunting with me that fall in Wisconsin, so he just brought out the rifle so he didn't have to um, travel with it on the airlines. And he pulls out like six or seven boxes of ammo, and I'm like, holy smokes, Barry, how many deer are you planning on shooting? And he said, well, he goes, I figure you'll be able to use it. And I uh, wasn't sure what he was talking about. And he said, you know, I built this rifle, rifle for that sheep hunt, and you know, I figure my mountain hunting days are behind me, but Lord willing, yours are just beginning. And so I want, I want to give you that rifle under the condition that I can use it when I come out deer hunting. And I'm like, holy smokes, you know, and here's this, I don't know, four or $5,000 rifle. And uh, by, you know, probably I'd probably worth all more than all seven or eight of the guns I had at that time. Uh, maybe worth more than all the guns I still have, but I was like, man, that was pretty generous, you know, I wasn't sure what to say. So we went back outside, we were having a cold beer, and it was a hot summer day, and sitting on the swing watching the kids go down the water park, and he said, there's one other thing that Bear, uh, Karen and I would like to uh, do for you. He said, you know, I know, you know, you made my dream come true, and, you know, I've always wondered how I could repay you for that. And he said, I know your dream hunt, which was like something we'd talked about on our hunts. He said, I know your dream hunt is to hunt Cape Buffalo. And he said, I figured the best way that I can repay you for what you've given me is to take you on a Cape Buffalo hunt. So Karen and I have talked it over and we want to pay for you and I to go Cape Buffalo hunting together in Africa. He said, you pick the spot, you know? And I'm like, well, I, I don't know how to accept that. And, but eventually I just said, but I, I'm not gonna say no. <laughs> so I've arranged to find this outfit and we go to Mozambique um, near Kruger National Park. Alex McDonald was his, the outfitter's name. And so Barry and I, we fly in there and it's just totally new for us. I'd been to Africa once actually, uh, same kind of a deal. Dave Caston, the Alaskan assassin, he, uh, he took me to South Africa once. It was a high fence job. It was a cool experience, you know, but I don't know, hunting a high fence is just, I don't know, just not quite the same for me. So I wanted to make sure this buffalo deal was totally wild, you know. So we uh, we go go to uh, Mozambique, and it, I mean it was it was incredible, you know. We were trying to shoot the Duga boys, these old um, bulls that aren't part of the large breeding herds, you know, kind of past their prime, their physical peak. That's kind of what we're targeting. And, I think it was the first or second day we were out driving around it there wasn't buffalo everywhere there's a lot of animals no doubt but um we we saw this herd and i mean they're huge bulls they kind of like a muskox they the the big bulls will come to the outside and then the women and children the cows and calves will go into the inside and then they'll protect them and I don't know, there was about a hundred of them in this one herd that we saw, and we were like, oh man, this is going to be awesome. So, uh, Barry went on a stalk, uh, I think for a buffalo, like the third day, we got in real close into some brush, and we kept bumping this bull, um, and finally the trackers, they backed off, and they're just like, nah, -uh. you know, it's too thick, you know, it, it's, it was a recipe for disaster, so we backed out. But I got to say, that was probably... What I was most interested in, I think all those years, I think what really the allure for me for a Cape Buffalo hunt more than anything was to see the trackers work. You know, I'd heard all these stories from so many people that I guided all these years and they all kind of said, you know, man, that's, that's the ultimate, go Cape Buffalo hunting. 
And I heard about these trackers and these guys telling me how they could track an animal over like 100 yards of solid rock, you know, and I'm just like, man, how is that even possible? And I mean to tell you, it was phenomenal to watch those guys work. So I think it was the fourth day we went up this um, drainage. Brushy, most of the country was fairly flat, kind of sparse brush. Most places you couldn't see more than like 200 yards and then in a lot of the country, you know, you couldn't see more than about 50 or 60. So this was kind of the small hills, just rolling terrain. You couldn't, we couldn't get in there with a vehicle. And so we kind of hunted the whole block with um, by roads. I think the hunting area we're in, I, I want to say it was like 35,000 acres. So it was fair size. Um, the anti po the the rhino poaching thing. I'm making a video on this. I'm working on it as you know as we speak. Um, the anti poaching efforts for the rhino that were on ongoing were pretty pretty wild. They actually had a couple of chases where they were, they were after some poachers. Um, it was a full moon, and so the uh, the poaching activity is usually high. Um, so we got in on some chases, never caught anybody, but that was kind of a that's probably an episode in and of itself is how that all went down. But that was, it was pretty incredible, the efforts that they were taking. Basically, Alex and, and McDonald and their company, they have some donors, some of their hunters would donate. And I mean, they had helicopters, they had tons of trackers and um, ex-military men that were, you know, kind of foremen, if you will, um, to try to stop these poachers. It was pretty, pretty... It was amazing. Uh, we did see a couple rhinos while we were there. But anyways, so we were hiking up this drainage um, and then not very long in, they found um, the spore, the scat of a, a lone bull. And so we're tracking for like a mile, you know, and every once in a while I'd see some sign and I'm just like, man, how do they, how do they really know there's a lone bull? And then they lose it for about a half an hour and Alex and Barry and I were kind of just sitting around BSing and after a while we're getting kind of bored and I'm like, ah, it looks like it's a bust, you know, and I'm kind of starting to wonder, like, man, does this, does that ever actually work? And then all of a sudden, they heard a whistle and then, you know, the, all the, they had three trackers and they were kind of spread out, two main trackers and one game scout, I guess, really kind of a, I don't know, government dude there to make sure. He was just there to kind of tag along and help, really. Edward was his name. So we had Kidmore and Nicholas were the trackers. And once they'd lose a track, they were just like a pack of hounds, you know, they'd just make bigger and bigger and bigger circles to try to find the track. And then once they'd get it, boom, you know, we were off. And they could track basically as fast as we could walk when, when they were on it. And then they'd lose it, and then they'd kind of fan out, and they'd find it again. So we'd get up to the top of this ridge. So we are about two, maybe three miles into this track job, I guess, get up on top of this hill, and then Kidmore looks back at Alex and he says, the bull has joined a herd of zebra. And I'm like, oh, what? And I'm like, how does he know that the zebra didn't just, you know, there was a herd of zebra and there was the buffalo. All I can figure is that he was like consistently seeing zebra tracks, buffalo tracks, and then zebra tracks on top of the buffalo tracks again. Anyways, I was like, whatever. <laughs> and then he started moving real slow, Kidmore. And he didn't go not a hundred yards. And all of a sudden he just crept down and did this. And so Alex slipped in, Barry slipped in, and I went right behind him. And then in this sparse shadowy timber, I see some zebras and I'd like see one. And then all of a sudden I'd see another one. And I'm like, well, okay, yeah, there's a herd of zebra. And then all of a sudden right in the middle of them, Here's this great big black shadow moving, and it was Cape Buffalo. He steps, um, steps clear of some bush, and you could just see horns, you know. And Alex tells Barry what to do. He's like, yeah, just wait, and you know, and I'm right on there, and then boom, Barry touches one off. He had a 375 blazer, and um, the the buffalo lurches, runs off. I mean, he's just gone, and. Alex kind of pulls Barry out and we're kind of getting ready. We're just sitting there and listening. And all of a sudden, he just gives this big death moan. Um, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And 
So we butcher the thing out. We're we keeping the uh, the fillets they call them, the the back straps, uh, the hide, the head, the horns. And then the plan was we were so far removed we were going to come back the following day because by this time it's like mid afternoon I think. The plan was we'd come back the following day and then they were going to butcher it up and then hang the quarters in the area for leopard baits. So we hiked back, Leon kind of the the novice, the packer, the guide trainee was there and I made a joke to Alex. I'm like, if, if this kid's gonna make it in this business, he's gonna have cold beers waiting for us. And sure enough, as soon as we got there, he held out cold beers to us. I was too dry and parched to even think about a beer at that point. Barry and Alex cracked one. Uh, on the way back, we ran into uh, a herd of kudu and Barry was able to jump out, made a made a quick uh, stalk, and shot a really nice kudu, 62 inches. It was a beautiful, beautiful kudu. We had gone on a couple of stalks for kudu before that, uh, at that point as well. So Barry had a, had a kudu in Cape Buffalo, and then he handed the rifle over to me. He said, all right, it's your turn. So our plan was we were going to hunt Cape Buffalo for me uh, that morning, and then in the afternoon we were going to go back, get anything that was left. We covered that carcass up a berry's bull with brush we we're gonna hang it you know so we went hunting that morning for me uh, I think maybe second or third water hole we stopped at they found sign of a lone bull again and so we tracked it and the area we were hunting there was fairly flat kind of yellow grass you know is there winter time I think it was June I guess really sparse timber kind of like dry desert stuff we saw a snake I don't even remember what kind it was something poisonous and deadly I'm not a big snake fan but at the same thing they'd find the uh, the spore and then you know they'd be on it I mean and they'd be more or less running and then all of a sudden they'd lose it again and we'd take off so we tracked that puppy for like if I remember right it was about two and a half hours it was a long time and I mean and we were going most of the time just going and they, you know, they kind of, we were kind of figuring that, you know, sooner or later this bull's just gonna jump up. He's gonna be bedded here somewhere. And it was getting pretty hot. So we get to the point where we could see the road that marked the boundary of the hunting area. They had these, uh, they call it leadwood, these old posts that the Portuguese, when they came and took over and colonized the area, they had these wooden posts. Um, along the roads with fence that they'd put a fence on. There was no barbed wire. I, I, I don't know is that the barbed wire rotted before the post. I'm assuming somebody took it down, but um, this wood lasts a long time, super, super dense, throws out tons of heat. But anyways, we could see the post, so we knew the road was right there. So we had, I don't know, no more than 100 yards to the road. And so we all kind of, oh, there's the road. And so we all kind of let our guards down a little bit and just said, well, it's, Go to the road and get to the road. We call Alex calls Leon. I set my rifle on the um, on one of the posts and I walked down this red dirt road to film the tracks where the buffalo had crossed. Meanwhile, Kidmore, one of the trackers, he went up the other way on the road to look for the track. Well, I go maybe about a hundred yards down the road and all of a sudden I hear, and I turn and I look and there was probably a cluster of maybe ten to twenty trees, just little. Yeah, there are trees there more than shrubs, but you know, foliage up above, not just down to the bottom. And in that little stand of trees, 30 yards from the road on our side of the road is just that classic silhouette of a Cape Buffalo. The horns just came way down and then they just kind of curled up. They didn't like curl back in. And you know, they started waving for me to come. So I kind of duck walk and hustle along grab my rifle off the post and I sneak up to Alex and he's like all right he said we can't he said if the bull dies in on this side of the road we won't be able to retrieve it so he said we got to get up there and hope the bull runs back into our area if he does we can take him he said if not we just got to let him go I'm like okay so we sneak ahead and a Cape Buffalo I mean he's sitting there watching us the whole time I mean Kidmore is like 30 yards away and that buffalo is just staring at him you know so Kidmore is just kind of I'm sure he is to some degree nervous anyways <laughs> and excuse me 
And so we sneak up by Kid Moore and we kind of ease ahead, more or less put ourselves directly between, we're still on the road, um, it's just a two lane track, you know, just dirt road. So we put ourselves in between the buffalo and the road and eventually, you know, he just kind of gives like a hop step and then he takes off and he starts to run and so then Alex lays down the sticks, he's like, he'll stop. So like, like these buffalo, you know, they'll, they'll stand up to lions and leopards and anything else. And so, and that's pretty much what he was doing with us, you know. He wasn't going to try to outrun us. He was going to see if we were going to come at us, you know. He was, he was going to fight. Um, or if we were going to continue to cut at, come at him, you know, eventually he'd stand his ground. So he, he just stopped. So about, I don't know, 100 yards away, 120 tops. And I laid my rifle across the sticks and I just took kind of a high shoulder spine shot, I guess, where I would shoot a moose. And uh, boom, and just dumped him like a sack of potatoes. And so he had, well, actually everything, I, I, that was all I shot on that, that hunt was that buffalo. Um, Barry shot an impala as well, but everything we shot was a one shot kill. Um, and so we had the buffalo down. And I couldn't help but realize it's like, we tracked that thing for five miles and we gave up 100, no more than 100 yards from the end. We didn't see it through. And that patch of timber, I mean, we should have known, you know, it was hot and there's a bunch of shade. And you know, it just, that's one of those lessons that I think we all have to relearn over and over again in life is you just can never let your guard down. And there he was. I, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's kind of like a perfect, it was a perfect den. I mean, ama amazing stock, amazing tracking job. I mean, how those guys followed that thing like that is it, just astounding. Yeah, it, it just, and just what, what a great metaphor, you know, for things in life when, you know, you think how, how easy it would have been. Let's just say that Leon would have been right there waiting for us for whatever reason. You know, if I, if Alex would have called him, you know, 20 minutes earlier, say, Hey, we're almost to the road. You want to just go into this area and be waiting there for us? You know, I mean, any hunter knows that, you know, it's like, you walk down a trail, I was teaching my kids that the other day, we walking down a trail, we could see these deer watching us. And I said, okay, let's stop. And then we stopped. Of course the deer, then they watch that. Well, then they get nervous and they take off and run, you know, and they're like, oh man, that's, that's they, you know, just teaching them that you gotta make them nervous. That's why you gotta move slow, you know? So this is one of those lessons that we'll all relearn in, in various ways. And I'm sure I could find some script, scriptural application to it i know you know they talk about um um uh, paul i guess i don't really remember he talks about how we're running a race you know when we you know the the sprinter wins the prize but um i guess that's not my point here my 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 point or my message on this you know i talked a little bit about reaping and sowing last week but that definitely came to my mind as we were driving back to base camp that night i'm just like man all or that night, I don't know if I said last night, but that night we shot the buffalo. Incidentally, before I forget, we went back to Barry's kill the next day because it took too much time skinning, butchering, and all that stuff with mine. Um, but that carcass was like completely bone dry. There was nothing left of it. Lions, and, lions, hyenas, and vultures. There was vulture poop everywhere. But it was amazing. The, uh, um, the rib bones of a Cape buffalo, you know, most animals, like if this is a rib bone, this is a rib bone, you've got a, a gap between them. Well, the rib bones on the Cape Buffalo are like armor. They're like overlapped. And so there's like meat and intercostal muscle is in between the ribs still, but the ribs are overlapped. So it's just like armor. But there, I mean, that, that carcass was like chalky dry. I think it was probably totally gone the evening he shot it. But anyways, uh, we're driving home that night and I'm just like, man, how, how am I'm actually here, you know? Here I am, just this podunk farm kid from Wisconsin that had these crazy dreams. 
you know, I wanted to guide in Alaska. I wanted to be an outdoor writer. I wanted to be, um, make hunting films. I wanted to hunt New Zealand. I wanted to hunt like, uh, your, your, like Asia or Eurasia somewhere. Um, and I wanted to hunt Cape Buffalo in Africa. And I did, I had, at that point, I had done all those things. And in my mind, I remember thinking, you know, what now, what's next? I sat up on the back of the high rack of the truck with the trackers, you know, it was a nice day just to kind of soak it all in, kind of just be by myself. And, you know, Alex and Barry were in the front, but I just kind of wanted to sit in the back and just kind of be quiet. And, uh, um, yeah, it just, I don't know, just like to soak it in. You know, that's one piece of advice I'd give people. You go on a hunting adventure, take at least a day afterwards. Don't rush home. Just let it stay in camp. Let it soak in. Because that truck truck ride home was like really pivotal for me. You know, at that point I had, you know, young family. And I just, like, nothing at all appealed to me. Like, that I should do or to make a goal for me. And, I, and, you know, in my mind, I was like, okay, is Barry sowing or am I reaping at this moment? Or both? It, was, it wasn't like depressing or a letdown in any way like it was when I, you know, I had this goal of, I think I've mentioned it before, about shooting a Pope and Young deer. You know, when I first started bow hunting, you know, and I remember when I did it, um, I was going kind of through my, my depression phase of life actually when this happened and I just got up into my tree and I, and I didn't even have my bow hoisted up and I saw this buck coming down the way and I bring up my bow and I untie it and I get an arrow and my release on. I mean, about two seconds later, the deer steps out, boom, fat, you know, and I smoke it and I knew I made a perfect hit and it runs off and I mean, I was so excited for about three seconds. And then I'm just like, man, your whole life is practically revolved around shooting a Pope and Young Deer and you just did it, but guess what? You're no different, you know? You're still the same person, your problems haven't changed, life is no different. And I just realized the frailty of, you know, you'll hear it called chasing the world is just things of the world, things of the flesh. And when I was in the back of a Land Rover, I didn't feel like empty, but I knew it was a pivotal moment in my life. And I just recognized that there was nothing of any significance for me to do personally at that point. And I didn't really know exactly like where I was gonna, you know, what that really meant. I mean, maybe I'm still processing it, but it was, it was a pivotal moment. And I couldn't help but, looking back at it now, I can't help but think that it was, I guess I'd have to believe that God brought Barry and I together. And I don't think that Barry would, uh, I'm quite certain Barry would agree, you know, and I don't think, you know, Barry didn't, I don't think he had, I don't, I don't think that was his motive for giving it to me. I think he just wanted to do something nice for me, you know, but that really changed my perspective on how I was to live my life. I mean, it was humbling for somebody to give me something like that beyond you know, I mean, that's kind of an obvious thing, but it was so humbling for me. And, and so it was just like, man, he gave me something that I probably could never give myself. And, and so I almost, I didn't feel like that, like I, I had to do it out of like guilt or, um, you know, like it was required of me, but I just felt like, okay, it's time for me to return the favor. And I suppose to some degree, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of my job. I mean, yeah, I, I made Barry's dream come true, but he certainly didn't owe me that hunt. But from that point on, I, I've kind of been really searching for what can I give to other people? And that definitely has, it opened my eyes to kind of like the meaning in life 
why we're here. Because I think as long as you have something that you want, you know, if that's your driving motivator in life or just something that's in the back burner, that's always, you know, obviously that's always going to be there. But once you get to the point where, you know, like for me, all I, all I want is, you know, like for, for me personally is just to kind of when I go away to be safe that I can always just be the only thing I want for me is just to be there for my family ultimately and then from that point on is just do the best I can to share the gospel share the light however I can with others and it's pretty simple that way you know it doesn't mean that life's always you know grand and easy and you know rosy but that's it, it, that's as good as it gets. I mean, it's cool. I got my buffalo sitting up in my uh, the skull, the European skull. It cost thirty five hundred dollars to get that skull. <laughs> By the way, if I'd have known it was going to cost that much, I, I honestly I wouldn't have even done it. Especially at that point, I didn't. Uh, yeah, we were. That was. I mean, that's that's a lot of money to me now, but that was definitely a lot of money to me then. Um, I remember they, they wanted a thousand dollar down payment to get it home and I'm like a thousand dollars and they're like well if it's uh, less than that we'll refund you the money well of course I was like well that ain't gonna happen but I, I just figured well that's gonna you know there might be a little bit more than that but at any rate neither here nor there I guess uh, you gotta pay to play I guess um, so anyhow It is. There, there is nothing greater than giving of yourself to someone else. There's nothing more rewarding or more fulfilling. So I want to read a verse. Ecclesiastes 2. And that will be my challenge is to read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's kind of like half depressing. It's in the, uh, it's in the Old Testament. Alright, King James Version. New, New King James Version. So I'm going to read the whole second chapter. So this is, uh, I can't remember his name. So I think this was David's son. So he was like a king, King David's son. I said with my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, but surely this also, you know what, I'm going to read, I'm going to water this down a little bit, because I don't think we're going to lose a whole lot with this translation, it's just going to be, okay. I said to myself, <laughs> excuse me, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good, but that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. My mind still guiding me. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I <coughs> acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this my wisdom stayed with me. So in all this my wisdom stayed with me. He had everything 
Everything he was given, but his wisdom, his own intellect stayed with him. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. When I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom, and also madness and folly, what more can the king's successor do than what, was already, what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads, while fools walk in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not long be remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows? So I hated all the things, all the things that he had amassed because he was going to leave them for his successor. He's going to, somebody was going to inherit that, those physical possessions. <coughs> and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor, labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without him who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. That's kind of why I started all this is, you know, I found this, got into this place of fear, you know, largely Ego pride of, you know, how was I going to take care of my family and physical things that were going on with my body, you know, what am I going to, how, if, you know, if I can no longer guide, how am I going to support my family and kind of just came at a time where, you know, the bills were piling up and money was sparse and I just got sucked into my, my own flesh sucked me in and that's all I was focused on was things of the world and it was it was killing me you know I, I've talked about that before and so I, I feel like I really understand you know, I, I, to a degree <laughs> what uh, what he's saying and this is just a New Testament that's why I read it out of my off my phone but um, but he talks about how it's it's basically what I get out of it is that it's meaningless to try to obtain things, wealth, things of, of the world, of the flesh, and try to stockpile them, to hoard them, and then just to give them to somebody else. And I think when he says that, you know, it's going to come to, it's going to be given to God's people eventually, that doesn't necessarily mean your children, whoever you want to have it. In fact, I think that happens so often is something is... Um, given or something is inherited from someone um, you know if you, if you don't have uh, if you didn't work for something you'll never appreciate it you know and you don't know where where it comes from you won't appreciate that 
won't get into politics, but look at what's happening in our world. Things that are given to you are meaningless, you know. No, I mean, if your kids are involved with you and your business and, you know, that sort of thing, I'm, you know, I'm all about that. But um, I, don't, I think anybody with any life experience kind of knows what I'm talking about. Like, like you look at the lottery, what is it like, I don't know, two thirds of the people that win the lottery go broke. Because they they didn't they didn't know how to manage a little bit. Well, you give people more, that doesn't make them any better managers at what they they had. Their whatever they did with less money is exactly what they're going to do with more money. Um, so the point of uh, I guess the point that I get from that is that you know he he figured out David's son again. I forget his name, um, Colath or something. Uh, I could be way off. I guess it doesn't really matter. But it's just that there's there's nothing. There's nothing better on this earth to do than our, our work, whatever it is, the job that God has for us. And I don't think that necessarily means like our vocation, but whatever, you know, God's the cornerstones and we're all stones. We all fit into his foundation, his church, his, the body of Christ. There's nothing better than to do that. And, and that's kind of what I've found with guiding is like, I'd much rather guide than I would hunt for myself. Um, the fulfillment is way, way better. I know I've, I've mentioned that before. So I've got a couple of verses here. Um, you know, I was kind of wondering where I'm going to go with this. And then, I don't know, I just started reading and this hit me. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse 11 through 14. In him, Jesus, also we have ob obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise." who is the guarantee in our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We when Jesus died and we after you know his death his resurrection and we believe and trust in him when we are truly born again we repent from our sins believe in Jesus name declare him as Lord and are baptized in Jesus name and into his Holy Spirit we too die our old man dies and then we become his son, his children, and we reap an inheritance. Jesus paid our debt, that is our salvation, that we are remitted from our, our sins, from who we were before the Holy Spirit, when we, after we are sealed, or from before we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We... If without that, without knowing that we have an inheritance when we leave here, actually, actually not even before we leave here, but upon turning from our ways, we become in communion with God and we become a disciple of Jesus Christ, that inheritance is ours. Once we are one with God, just like my family, this, is, this was my grandpa's land, this was his life's work, and I think about him every time I walk out here. My grandpa basically poured his heart and soul the last 25 years of his life into building this. I'm sitting on a dam that he built right here. So he called it starvation farmland. He bought it cheap. Uh, it was swampy. 
and he dammed it up so that he could trap and create wetlands for fur-bearing animals. And so this is like his legacy, his earthly legacy anyways. And so my dad inherited it from him. And, you know, I, I, I tell my parents all the time, spend all your darn money because <laughs> you guys, my parents worked for it. Um, but, you know, I, I, whatever they want to do is fine. It's not like I'm, I actually, I, I could, in a lot of ways, I could kind of like care less if I did inherit anything from my parents, but it's like, I have no, I don't have like, I'm not in discord with my parents. So I don't believe that to spite me or I have any reason to believe that, you know, they're not going to want me to have something should they die before I do. I mean, that's kind of like, I hope, don't look into that too much, I, I, but, I, but I think there's some symbolism there. You know, if I'm at discord with my parents, um, or any of us are, we probably are to believe that there might not be an inheritance there. You know, and I think if we're in, my point is this, is that if we're in discord with God, and we spend our lives living for ourselves, I don't think we can expect an inheritance. The Bible tells us that we can't, that, that we won't. And so we have that choice. We can either accept, we can either be sons of the world or sons of the Most High God through faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that's making sense. And then um, I look to Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that. We were sinners. God sent his son to die for us as sinners. Not because he loved us because of the good things we did. He just, he, he loved us, he created us in his image. And he was willing to pay the ultimate price for our redemption. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled reconciled, uh, made right, being one, in communion with. We shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have received upon our faith in Jesus and our following him, are turning from our old ways and following him, we have an eternal inheritance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the people that you've brought into my life. Lord, I thank you for my grandparents, for my parents. I thank you for Barry. Thank you, Lord, for Kurt Bedingfield, Dan Sailors. I thank you for the two truckers that I sat next to at a sports show in somewhere in southern Wisconsin that handed me this New Testament right here. Thank you, Lord, for Jeff, Jim. Preston. Thank you for my wife. My children. And I thank you for all the times where death was so close and I knew it and I felt hopeless. I thank you that you were patient with me, that you delivered me from those experiences, those trials, 
and Lord, it's just a hundred yards from me from a tree that I can see right now is where I fell and fell. And I talked about that last week. That was over 20 years ago. And I'm dealing with that as we speak. It was a mistake that I made. And I believe that you're using that experience to refine me. And Lord, every person watching this that's praying with me right now, there's an experience in their life that they are trying to work through. Just like many of the experiences that we've all been through, that I know that I've been through, that at the time I don't see, we can't see, we can't discern what there is to learn or how it's going to benefit us. But as we seek ye first your kingdom and we put our faith deeper into you and disavow the things of the world, our own flesh, and walk away from sin, we'll see the world the way you see it, the way you intended it. And you will consecrate us closer to you so that we may, we will, we will inherently, without even trying, share love and light towards others and produce fruit. Lord, you say that the tree that doesn't produce fruit, you will cast it into the fire. So, Lord, my prayer is that everyone here watching will cling closer to you, will trust your promises and receive your inheritance or your gift that is to be our inheritance of eternal life so that we can live in this life without fear, without condemnation, without shame, guilt, so that we may be blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Ah, All righty. That goose is just kind of hanging out there. I don't, yeah, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe it's right through me. I love coming out. I mean, I like... I, I, when I was a kid, I'd come out to this place all the time. There's a osprey. There's a few fish in here. Echo Lake flows into here. So my dad has seen a couple of fish. I see minnows in here. I've never seen like a fish. Um, but I, I go for walks out here until all the time. I, I remember like when I was, particularly once I got my driver's license, I'd come out here all the time that I could because it was a couple miles from our farm. And I'd just walk around and I'll never forget it. It was like I could get lost out here. It's 440 acres. And so, yeah, we had some blogging trails and whatever, but there was, there's nothing, there's nothing cool or, I think this is like a metaphor for life, is you've got to get lost. You know, you've got to go places where you've never been. And that's the thing, like, you know, in this Ecclesiastes, you're talking about how your toil, your work, is your gift from God. And it's so easy in our world when I see young people, I love the opportunity to talk to young people. When I can talk in schools, you know, you talk about chasing your dream, you know, and this kind of stuff. And, and a lot of, <sighs> and, and you know, and as Christians, you find your purpose. And I don't, it kind of gets abused maybe sometimes, but I think that's largely kind of true. And when I look at it, if I wouldn't have done that, if I wouldn't have like done the things that I felt called to or interested in, if I wouldn't have pursued those things, I honestly think that I, I have to, I, I, I guess I believe, I think, I probably would have never been saved. I don't think I'd ever found God. I think I'd have just got into a pit of despair. 
and the world makes a lot of empty promises, you know, like a college education for one thing, man, you know, when I look at it now, I got this young kid in mind here, a friend of my, uh, a friend of mine, his young kid, he's hardworking, gets, you know, maybe mediocre grades, I don't really know, but I know he's not the top of his class, but he's just a good kid and he, and he's hardworking and I'm like, man, you just learn some trade, take a couple business classes or something right now and man, you'll have, you'll have it licked, you know, because nobody wants to do any physical work. But yeah, that was like the, it's just to shut out, you, you got to shut out the noise, be still and know that I am God and, and find your, your, your niche in life and enjoy, spend your life doing things you like to do. Maybe you got to work a job that you don't necessarily like. I get that, you know, you got bills or whatever, but outside of that, you know, your job isn't your identity. Outside of that is find some work for, the Bible says that, you know, what you reap for the flesh, you might get back in the flesh, but you won't get it back in the spirit. Um, you know, I'm paraphrasing there, definitely. But find your, your work for God, and that ultimately, that's what's going to ensure your inheritance. Till next time, trust the guide. God bless you all. Give you a little tour here, maybe. So yeah, we got some beaver houses out there. Right over there was that tree, the tree that I fell out of there 20 years ago. So this was the, the dike that my grandpa built. I don't know, it took him like a couple of years, I think, to build that. He had a bulldozer. Here's one of our tree stands. Scout, where are you at? We'll see you next time.